Today's topic is about how an IB education brings out the best in your child. So it is going to be a one hour workshop where we talk about tips to parenting. Next, please. Before we begin, I would like to explain about the meeting etiquette today. First of all, okay, join the meeting as you have already have really done that. Number two, we we'll appreciate it if you can mute your mic so you can have the best webinar experience. Number three, okay, please pay attention to the presenter. And number four, if you have any question, please type in the chat box and our speakers will attend to you after the workshop. And now when you are called, please unmute yourself and you can actually start talking. Thank you so much for following and observing the meeting etiquette. Next, please. We are very excited to have two very good speakers today. The first speaker is Dr. Vincent Chen. Dr. Vincent is the principal of Fairview International School, and then he is the winner of the Lifetime Achievement Awards for Education Excellence, awarded by the Kingsley Strategic Institute. Our next speaker, our second speaker is Mrs. Li Shen Chu. Mrs. Chu is an IB parent of a very adorable twin, and she is an advocate of inclusive education. Both of them are very experienced in education. Next, please. Let me actually set the tone for this webinar. A lot of parents, they always ask this kind, these four questions. The first question they ask, what is exclusive education and how does it impact your child? The next question would be, how does an inclusive education benefit your child? Next, how do IB programs promote inclusivity? How does inclusive education look and feel from a parent's eyes? Dr. Vincent and Mrs. Chu will answer most of these questions, all of these questions today. So without further ado, it's my honor to present to you, Dr. Vincent Chen. Dr. Vincent, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Derek. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to start off with a, a little story. Um, and this is a real story uh, from my psychiatry days. Um, of course, I won't say who it is, but um, let's just call him John. So John goes to an exclusive school. Right? He, he, went, he worked really hard to get there, passing entrance exams and then doing his best every day to make sure his, his portfolio of activities looked the part. You know, exclusive schools tend to be quite selective in, in who they invite into joining their school. And this is a little bit of an extreme example, but it should demonstrate what exclusivity really means. Years went by, and in his prestigious school, John became driven by the need to keep up with his classmate and academics, usually, mannerisms, and how everyone seems to have the same goal, to become rich and famous and wealthy. Uh, he was taught by his environment that he was privileged because of his innate talent, his birthright gifts, that his intrinsic advantage had offered him opportunities that others would never have. So he worked as hard as he could, and while his grades weren't bad, he always had the need to do better because his personal worth was now tied to the status at this exclusive school. Eventually, John had became an adult, and while he didn't do badly in life, he had major challenges. Beliefs like discrimination were almost natural to him. Beliefs that one group of people were innately better than another were natural, more specifically. And he had an endless need to constantly drive himself to be better than others because it was a measure of his self-worth. This idea that his value was derived from being better than others. This caused all sorts of problems. It started with things like work issues, you know, working in teams, uh, problems there. And then it moved on to family problems as he imposed his psychological constructs on his wife and children. Eventually, he arrived at depression. And that's where I met him. Um, so, yeah, John is a real story, and he really demonstrates uh, one potential uh, pathway for children that go to an exclusive school and what usually happens. Now, I'm going to uh, identify what are the three core problems um, that exclusive education create. And just to be clear, an exclusive education is any educational system that excludes people. And the exclusion can happen in all sorts of ways. The most common one is academic. So if you can't pass my entrance exam, you can't be in my school. 
Uh, and these schools usually work on a cream in, cream out situation where they, they only admit the best so they can pretend they have high scores. And the second one is uh, if you don't know somebody, you can't come in because this is a club, uh, like a, a social club, and only um, the privileged few can come in, that sort of concept. Um, there are many of those uh, around the place. Uh, so those are some examples of what exclusive educational systems look like. But every school practices a degree of exclusivity. It, this is not a black and white. It's a bit of a sliding scale. The moment you have an entrance exam that determines the aptitude of a student, whether they can come in or not, that is where you begin to practice the concept of exclusivity. All right. So this is a sliding scale, as I, exam, as I shared. But we're going to talk about what happens when you drive it to one, one extreme. Uh, and that really will tell you about what are the issues that people face along the way. So firstly, externalized self-worth. Now, in many schools that practice exclusion, the child's drive to maintain their place in that exclusive school becomes increasingly externalized. And this, what this means is the locus of control shifts from I control my destiny to they control my destiny. It happens because of comparative words like you've got to do well in the test today. You need to maintain your grades to stay in the school. These shift the reason for doing things or put it another way, your locus of control to an external one. And just for comparison, words like do the best you can or I believe you can do it. Drive the locus of control internally to help the student believe that they can control their destiny. The second th important thing that actually happens is children in exclusive positions in schools that are exclusive achieve a certain elevated status in society. Uh, this subsequently results in increased pressure to succeed, impossibly increased pressure sometimes. For example, wow, you're in that school? You must be very smart. I'm looking forward to hearing you do great things. I, mean, I think we've all heard these words and probably said it at some point similarly. The pressure to succeed now becomes incredibly high to meet the expectations of others. And even if they are doing well, this is not constructive. And the final one, this is quite interesting. Their value becomes measured relative to others instead of based on their intrinsic self-worth. In many expensive schools, and this is particular to expensive schools where wealth is a measurement of exclusivity. Think uh, the school costs about maybe 100,000 ringgit a year just to get in. Um, wealth now becomes the marker of exclusivity. Children experience this unique pressure. For girls, the onus on being attractive is very high. Research tells us that girls in exclusive school were doubly affected by perceived beauty. Not taking care of your appearance is simply not acceptable for well-off young ladies. For boys, it's scarier. They're driven even harder to be at the top, the alpha male. The one whose status in society has been earned by his possession or command of the room. And this puts boys at risk to be less compassionate and kind. They can have a low capacity for tenderness in close relationships and a high comp capacity for chauvinism and narcissism. In, in a recent study, it was found that narcissistic exhibitionism among affluent boys at elite private schools were almost twice the average scores of a more diverse sample. Now, I'll share with you a little bit about um, some, some words about what is inclusivity. And it's really well done by this lady called uh, Professor Alan Taft from the Kellogg School of Management. Inclusion is not just about special education needs. And that's, that's a big problem because whenever you say the word inclusion these days, everybody just thinks special education needs, special education needs. And that's not really um, the way that it works. Inclusion is a philosophy. And inclusion is about welcoming developing and advancing a diverse mix of individuals. It's about making everyone feel valued and making sure that everyone feels that they have the same opportunity to advance and making an impact. Now, whether they do make an impact and whether they do advance or not, it's a different question, but making them feel welcome that everybody has that opportunity is inclusion. If we believe that every child is special, then every child has special needs. And let's treat them like the unique individuals that they are. Um, oh, sorry, just jump past this slide. Sorry. Okay, so benefits of an inclusive education. These are the, there are quite a few things that inclusive education does for kids, but these are the big, big three. Um, first, it internalizes self-worth by creating a safe space. This word safe space is very, very big. 
Secondly, individualized learning can begin to happen. And finally, very importantly, they develop empathy. Now, I'm going to explain them one by one. So, self-worth. By recognizing each individual as unique with his or her own challenges, the focus is on accepting people for what they are, not what we expect them to be. And this creates a less judgmental environment. And by default, a safe space, a place where a child feels safe. Incidentally, Google did this really big study about teamwork and what makes teams work really well. And the number one determinant of a great team is psychological safety. Isn't it strange that there's such correlation happening? When a person feels safe, they are let, they're more able to take risk around others, to explore more socially risky endeavors, confident that no one's gonna embarrass or punish them for making a mistake or asking a question or offering a new idea. The second big thing that comes out of this is that every child learns differently. When they are in an environment where everyone welcomes their uniqueness, they can explore different ways of learning, like kinesthetic learning or some difficult memory techniques. If a child is constantly belittled, every time he asks a question with a response like, if you don't know that you shouldn't be in this class or this school, then they're not, they're not going to want to reveal any of their weaknesses. In an inclusive classroom, students feel free to ask for help, fall down, and get back up. Your child learns by constantly venturing outside his comfort zone to explore new things, to wonder. And he can only do that if effectively if he feels safe to do so. Finally, the very important one, by shifting the focus from how you are better than others to everyone is unique, accept them, Children, I encourage you to invest time to understand others. Automatically, this develops empathy and it enhances their relationship with other people. By seeking first to understand, the world is no longer a place where they seek to, they look to take advantage of other people to be better than others or to gain the upper hand, but a place where everyone has their own individual challenge. And once they really empathize and understand this concept, they will naturally seek to help those around them because they feel their pain as well. Okay, so I shared a lot of theoretical basis uh, about what is exclusivity and inclusivity and why inclusivity is really good for your child compared to exclusivity. And um, I'm gonna have uh, pass the time over to my, the wonderful Miss Lysian to share with you a little bit about you know, how she feels from the parents' eyes and as an uh, inclusive advocate as well. Over to you, Lisa. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Vincent. Can you hear me, everyone? Yep. Yes. Okay. So, um, hi, everyone. My, my husband and me are parents to twins, uh, a girl and a boy. One is a, a special child. Uh, can you go back to the slide before? Sorry. The slide before. Just stay on the slide that, that says inclusive education. Okay. Um, one is a special child with Down syndrome. And the other one is a neurotypical or regular child, as they say. And they are also children of mixed uh, parentage, as my husband is Malaysian Indian and I'm Malaysian Chinese. And um, so perhaps we are in a very unique position to talk about inclusive education as we want inclusive education for both our children for a wide range of reasons. And uh, here is what we hope inclusive education will realize for each of our children. So we, for a special child, of course, we want a school that would be able to integrate her fully with regular peers in a mainstream classroom and in all classes, not in just selected classes. Also a school that would work closely with us to um, adapt uh, and uh, what is needed to support our daughter in the mainstream system so that she can learn early on how to survive in the real world with regular uh, people. Yet, we also want a school that is robust enough, you know, with a syllabus that's ch challenging enough for her twin brother, our regular child, and a school that not only focuses on uh, academic achievements, but on developing soft skills and also building character because because of his special sibling, we are especially um, sensitive uh, and we want a school that would promote an inclusive mindset that would also inculcate in him some kindness, compassion and appreciation for diversity. So uh, like what Dr. Vincent says, even though we always think about inclusive uh, and inclusion, inclusive education. Sorry, can you go back to the other slide? Um, the on. Uh, inclusive education, we it's a much larger concept actually. And I, I strongly 
believe that inclusive education actually benefits all children because when you have an inclusive uh, pedagogy and an inclusive school, um, you will find that you know the environment, the teachers, and all the support systems are are things that will honor all children. You know, you we we all. We all want a school that rec where teachers recognize each child's strengths and weaknesses. A school that will take time to discover how each child learns and provide learning differentiation. And also, um, we, we want people who are sensitive. And, you know, it's very important, I think, nowadays to be inclusive because, you know, even if you don't have special needs, um, sometimes you will run into problems. You will face difficult situations like the current pandemic, for example. And, and all of us will grow old or we will have points of weakness and we will need other people to help us. And if we are raising community-spirited children, then you will have more of these people in, in society, I think. So that's my take on it. Thank you, Lucien. You're welcome. Um, okay, so I'm going to share with everybody now what the IB does. Uh, to promote inclusivity in the classroom. And really there are four key things. I'm gonna go through each of these things again uh, in, in, the, in detail, so don't worry about it. I'm gonna use some big words here. So international mindedness. This is kind of a philosophy that we have in the whole program. So when I say whole, it's absolutely everywhere. Um, actually, all these things we do absolutely everywhere. So when I say international mindedness, it's gonna be present in your class, the classrooms. It's gonna be present in um, the, the assemblies, it's going to be present in the, the service and action, the co-curricular activities, it's going to be present all over the place. So all of these concepts are pretty much everywhere. So international mindedness, let's begin there, okay? Um, right at the core of the IB programs is this concept. It is defined as the belief that others with their differences can also be right. Now, this is a very open-minded statement. This philosophy is the polar opposite of traditional education that drills into each answer that there's only one right answer for each exam question. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're doing exams uh, from the age of, I think you'll start at about maybe six years old, all the way to 18 years old, for 12 years of your life, you're being told nonstop for each question, there is a right answer and you need to answer that perfectly. Imagine what happens if that same message gets put forward to you for 12 years straight, that you're going to get it into your head that there is one right answer to every question of life, that I need to search for the one right answer, that I find my security there. That's why a lot of people cannot accept open-ended statements. They, they can't accept that, that you know, there isn't a right way of doing things. Then they're always looking for that security. Um, IB children, on the other hand, they're open-minded. They're taught to listen first and try to accept other people as they are. Uh, go back one slide, please, Shirley, you're moving too fast for me. Okay. IB children, uh, they're open-minded, ready to listen, and they try to accept other people as they are and not force others into their own opinion. They become wonderful leaders because they are able to accept people for what they are, not what we expect them to be. Okay. All right. I'm going to move to the next thing that the IB does. That's really powerful. Inquiry-based teaching and learning. And for most people, you may have heard this word out there. It's one of the most powerful uh, teaching techniques I've ever seen, but it's also one of the worst understood ones. Yeah. Many teachers believe that inquiry-based teaching and learning is about asking a lot of questions to their students. This is called interrogation, not inquiry. Inquiry is the process of drawing out curiosity, asking things like, what could it be instead of what's the right answer to my question? Children become interested to learn. You draw out their curiosity. They're happy in the process of learning, not panicky and terrified whenever the teacher comes into the room, expecting to get interrogated and embarrassed in front of other people. It's about welcoming possibilities, not pigeonholing children into one right answer. It's about the discovery of knowledge and interest, not being told you are going to like this and you're going to learn this. Inquiry-based teaching and learning creates the environment for children to feel safe to explore. And it sends the message that invites students to go beyond their boundaries. It creates the right environment to nurture inclusiveness. The third really important thing 
It's called differentiation. Now, this is a, another teaching technique that we use all the time. And it's the process of educating the child where they are, not where we expect them to be. To help the child learn in a way that's appropriate for them, taking into account their uniqueness. So teachers pay attention to their learning styles, ability levels, language levels, and interests when constructing the educational experience. As a result, the learning experience and assessments are personalized to the children and allows the educator to really challenge each child, not just on one scale, which is usually how well they can memorize for a test, but on many scales, language, academic ability levels, skills, motivation. Where a traditional classroom is only one kind of assessment, the paper and a pen exam, the IB classroom has many kinds of assessments from working in groups to presentations and even making videos to convince the prime minister to adopt solar power. And finally, perhaps the most commonly spoken about thing that every parent wants to, to find out, character development. Inclusivity, in, when you have an inclusive environment, you need to develop the character of the students so that they can fit into the environment and function there well. I've never seen any other educational system that so systematically develops character like the IB. Character development in the IB is based around the learner profile. 10 values that we wanna nurture in every child. Words like caring, principled, open-minded. Every single child at class experiences has value-based activities built into it so that children don't learn about being good in a, a separate room, like a morals class, like the way that's done. But they're integrated with whatever they're currently learning. So I'll give you an example. Like when you learn about electricity, uh, this would be form three about there. The light, uh, sorry, form one or form two, actually. Uh, the, maybe you learn about the light bulb and Edison, who invent, uh, supposedly invented it, will introduce a conversation about how Edison actually bought the patent of the light bulb and he didn't invent it. We'll, we'll discuss with the kids if it was the right thing for Edison to take all the credit for its invention, even when he didn't invent it, focusing on the, the value of being principled. In biology, we could consider how the world's food crisis could be solved with solutions like going vegan or eating insects and then role play with the kids. How do you persuade another person to take up one of these initiatives uh, or diets um, and, and focus them on being open minded to the possibility, even though it's a little bit gory or it's ve vegetables all day long, which the kids, you know, they would prefer to eat like um, fried French fries all day long, which is also a vegetable. Character development can be implemented in a separate class to learn it explicitly, like morals class, but it must be tightly integrated with all aspects of the learning experience to internalize that learning implicitly, to use it. Okay. Um, so those are the big four things. There's a lot of things the IB does, but I didn't want to really go on and on. So I really want to share you about the big four things that the IB does to promote inclusivity. Um, and I want to I'll leave you with two very important things. Um, a, a very wise person called Elaine Hall said, inclusion elevates all. You know, when you're not the crab in the bucket dragging down other people because they're climbing out of the bucket, you know, and you work together, everyone is, gets elevated in that process. And secondly, you know, when we talk about, uh, a lot of schools are going to talk about diversity. We have a great diversity in our school, but diversity is only the first part of that conversation. It's not where it ends. It's only the foot in the door. It's about diversity is having a seat at the table only. Inclusion is about giving your kids, having that voice. And finally, a sense of belonging is having that voice heard, recognizing each child's individual voice and then re uh, 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 respecting it as a different voice and not humiliating them or embarrassing them because of its, of its diversity. Um, so that's all I'm going to share about inclusivity and how the IB creates inclusivity as a part of our natural process and as a part of our philosophy. Um, and I'm going to pass the line over to Ms. Li Xian, who's going to really share with you about the effects and what she's seen and some practical parental tips about how to work with your own children. Over to you, Li Xian. Thanks, Dr. Vincent. Okay, um, well, this photo here is actually uh, my twins' first day of school. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them when they first started, you know, they were five. 
And before this, we had personally visited about 14 schools because, you know, it was very hard for me to, as I mentioned, to find a suitable school for both my children. So, um, and after all, inclusive education is not something, it's a vision, even for our country and our ministry and our education um, industry, even the private industry. So, um, it's, it's definitely not uh, widely practiced. Um, so, it's quite um, encouraged to find a school that after upon assessment uh, on a case basis that she, they, were, they, they said, okay, we'll try her out and we will, we will try our best to support her learning needs. So, she started in the school with her brother. And before that, they had already been in, attending an inclusive play school. So I, I could see all the benefits. And prior to that, uh, she also went to a special school since she was two months old, my daughter with Down syndrome. So as mentioned, uh, my son is a regular child. You know, he's neurotypical, as they say. Uh, although, like what uh, Dr. Vincent says, you know, who it, all of you, I'm sure all of you parents here will agree with me, which child is really typical? You won't really have a very typical child. Every child, has their own special or not special. They have their own quirks. They have their own unique personality traits. And every child has special needs in a way, you know, to some extent. And cognitively and physically, he could do everything that most children do. And um, his sister was about six months to a year behind him in uh, most things. So she started off in a reception class and he went to grade one. My daughter actually adjusted better socially and emotionally to school. Well, my son cried. He cried daily for the first three months of school. And he even told his teacher, uh, told me to tell his teacher not to tell him to stop crying because he was stressed out by her telling him to stop crying. So it was very sensitive. And, um, you know, and my daughter, of course, uh, she was frustrated in some ways because a lot of things, sometimes a lot of things that regular kids her age could do, she, was, she couldn't do. So she had some, you know, is issues where she would avoid tasks she would sometimes sit on the floor or go into the playhouse in the classroom. And then at that time, she couldn't read. She couldn't, um, she was fairly verbal. She couldn't read. She definitely couldn't write. She, her coloring in Google is not coherent. You can't understand. Why. It's definitely not, um, you know, uh, a way a regular child color. So we didn't know much about IB. And we, in fact, we were a little bit worried that uh, how is a child like her going to cope in an inquiry-based system? So, but today, we actually feel uh, that they are just talking to my, my husband after parents' day. We, we felt that we really made the right choice. Okay? So, if you can go to the next slide. This is, this is them uh, last month on their eighth birthday. So, three years have passed. And I'll tell you a little bit, but more, mostly I will show you uh, how they have grown and what they can do now, you know, especially in school. They turned eight. Um, I've seen a lot of positive changes. Um, as mentioned, my daughter had a lot, a few challenges in school, but usually it's very supported by the teachers in the school, the staff in the school, even her classmates and families. They always, um, the, the kids are very kind. They always wait for her when she doesn't finish, you know, and wait for her when she's slow to pack things. And then they encourage her when she can't do something quickly. Now, today, she can read on her own fairly well. So she can take, and she can also write and take notes, I'll show you later, and understand most of the concepts taught. When some adaptation or a little bit of simplification is done, she's not afraid to do presentations and performances in front of a school, in front of a class. Um, she's always game to try new things, and she has surprised us you know, a lot with her understanding of the world and constantly asking a lot of relevant questions uh, about things she sees around here. She can even play the violin a little bit with some help, and she's very tenacious. She loves, she's self-driven. She has a good work ethic and a positive attitude towards learning. So I would say she has exceeded our initial expectation in many, many ways in just three years. And for my son, you know, he has also shown a lot of personal growth. He always tells us how much he loves school, even though he's a very shy and introverted child in public. Um, and he likes subjects like maths, English. He's very curious about how things work. He's very observant, very reflective, and he's a very principled child. He has a very strong sense of justice and compassion to people and animals. And, but of course, he still fights with his sister. <laughs> he's not afraid to make mistakes and compared to when he first started. And when he, even though he still shies away from the spotlight, he is more comfortable 
today with doing presentations, offering opinions when asked, and he is also learning a bit more how to communicate more effectively and collaborate with people. So um, I credit a lot of this to the IB education that they are receiving. And I want to show you, um, I just take you to a quick slide and then I want to show you some videos and pictures of their progress. Next. So I would say, um, I won't repeat a lot of the points that uh, Dr. Vincent has uh, mentioned, but this is why we like, the, we like the system because it develops the whole child. Like, um, like uh, Dr. Vincent said, you know, character building is not, is not accidental, it's intentional. You know, they have 10 learner profiles that require you not to only to be an inquirer, knowledgeable thinker, communicator, but you also have to demonstrate that you're principled, open-minded, caring, and a risk taker, and balanced, and also reflective. And of course, so you develop, uh, you become a, a well-rounded person, I think. And it's inclusive by design and nature. It's di it has differentiation. It helps children overcome their um, weaknesses. You know? So your child may be academically strong, but he may need, the child may need, um, he or she may need some help in, in overcoming certain things that you know they're not comfortable with like my child you know he's not comfortable with speaking in public he doesn't like to be um, in uh, uh, sort of give his opinion he doesn't like to share things sometimes so and it's banded it's not fixed age groups and it's also you know it builds um, upon a lot of uh, activities and uh, lessons but teach them to be caring and active members of the community and another thing I like very much, which I'll show you in some videos, is how it connects the dots. So it's, there's a transdisciplinary approach. When you have a theme, it's taught across all the subjects, and um, it's not taught in isolation. So these are the transdisciplinary themes. And as Dr. Vincent mentioned, it's inquiry-based. It, it, it fosters a lot of critical and creative thinking. It's not just about questions. It's about drawing up curiosity and also um, challenging the status quo sometimes, challenging assumptions. And I also like that it works on core skills and not just content. Because as someone who used to work in the corporate uh, sector, core skills, uh, content, it passes very fast. And in, especially in our day and age, content changes all the time. So it's not um, practical to memorize content, you know, but you, if you have the core skills, um, they, they call it the approaches to learning like research skills, self-management skills, social skills, communication skills, thinking skills, then you are able to draw any content you want at any time. You know, you don't need to be relied on existing content. And of course, it's uh, education for the real world. It relates a lot of learning to real world uh, things and real world problems. And so learning is very meaningful because they can see things happening and also be very globally aware of issues around them, even though they are very young. Yeah, so next, um, okay. So I just want to show you um, the next slide, um, shall we? Okay. Okay, um, so I think somebody asked a little bit about assessments. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that in a, in a small way here. And I think Dr. Vincent can answer, give more, uh, a, a better response later. Well, um, we don't have exams, but we do have assessments. And they always do these uh, things called units of inquiry um, that are based on transdisciplinary themes about how the world works, how, how um, you know, sharing the planet and, and themes that relate to the real world. And then they, uh, at the end of the unit, usually they pre prepare a project. You know, there are a few small projects, but there's a big project at the end. And here are some projects that he did for a unit of inquiry relating to inventions and innovations. So my son, he likes cars. This, this is my son's work. He likes cars, so he wanted to focus on the car as an invention and also as an object for innovation. So in the, on the left side, you can see the, the car. He was talking about the invention of the car. You know, what are the things, the features of the invention? And then he was asked to think about some new innovations for the car that he imagined for the car. Then at, at the end of the semester project for his UI, he had to do research skills to pro he, he thought about okay he, how he was going to innovate in the existing invention of the car was by creating a flying car he was he used some data that he found from research he, he had to build a model and then he had to write a news article to launch the car and then he had to make a video to talk about it so he, you can see he's using a wide variety of skills many skills that are used you know, to me, is these are skills used in university, in college, you know, and even at the workplace, you need these skills. So these are very uh, important core skills and he's developing them now at eight. So 
So if you go to the next slide, you can see, and I'll just show you a few minutes or a few seconds of his video that he did to present um, his work because obviously all of us now are in online, in an online school environment. Hello, my name is Akash. I am an innovator. I am very excited today as I'm launching my new innovation today. In front of my of the Pajanas Twin Towers. It's Malaysia's first flying car called the Sky Car. Here's the logo. Our tagline is you never will be caught in traffic again. The name Sky Car is also from my name Akash that means sky in old Sanskrit language. I was inspired to build this car because I will always get stuck in traffic jams when traveling to Johor to visit my grandparents, going to school in Subang Jaya and the city. The car design was inspired by the car DeLorean from the movie Back to the Future. The car could fly and travel through time. From my research, I watched many YouTube videos and read many online articles to find out about how the car, how to make a car fly. I also read this book, Jet Plane, How It Works by David Macaulay to find out how a jet plane flies. I think it's something now. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, so just a, so you can see, you know, this is my child who three years ago is very shy, uh, doesn't like presenting, uh, doesn't like talking in public. So, you know, to me, this is a big milestone that he has achieved this, um, this past year. Okay, next, the next slide. Okay, and this is another assessment, another big year-end assessment that he had to do, which combines uh, what we call the trans, it's like a transdisciplinary approach. He was actually studying about uh, habitats and animal adaptation. So he had to research on his chosen habitat. He chose the polar region and he had to create a diorama during art class and do a maths data sheet showing the fractions relating to the animals that he has in his diorama. So, you know, he had to talk about all the number of like two polar bears, two over how many animals, two over 10 animals, you know, two polar bears over 10 animals. That's a fraction of the, the fraction from the whole. And then after that, he, they call it happy fractions. And then they also created a, a, a poster, you know, to discuss the animal adaptations to the polar region, what kind of uh, adaptations each animal had and issues relating to the human activities at, at the habitat, you know, like uh, oil drilling, you know, how does it impact the habitat, the impact on the environment, and he even had to propose some solutions, you know, so he was, you know, he had to say things like, uh, he, he was talking about how people should cycle more, drive less, so you don't have to uh, drill so much oil for use. So, of course, uh, there's also a video uh, presentation of this. Okay, if you go to the next slide, this is his very latest, um, uh, his end of year uh, project uh, on the last UI he did for primary grade three. And this is a chart that, you know, we this time for his celebration of learning uh, event to show what he has learned um, over the past semester in school. He actually, um, we sat down to talk about all the things he learned in the different subjects and how they were connected. So obviously, the, as, as I mentioned, the unit of inquiry is usually based on a transdisciplinary team. Like this one is where we are in place and time. And the that time, for his, he was studying about structures. His unit was about structures. And in science and social science, he would uh, study about you know, man-made and um, natural structures. Uh, oh no, Lysian, I think we lost audio with Lysian. Uh oh, we lost audio, still don't have you. Mm, not yet. Sorry, everybody. Just give us a second, we'll sort this out. Oh. Okay. 
Okay, just give us a second, everybody. I really apologies for this. Unfortunately, these technical issues do turn up from time to time. Yeah, she's back. There we go. There we go. Nope, still can't hear you, Lisa. Maybe play around with the jack. So incidentally, while we were waiting for Ms. Lisa, there was a question put forward about how do we evaluate the IB children's progress? So I shared a little uh, blurb in the, the chat room. Um, so in each subject, we administer uh, two paper exam, paper and pen exams, and uh, two varied exams as well, like yeah. presentations. Oh, there we go, Lisa. Okay, I'll do the question later then. Oh. Can you hear me? You can, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it broke off a little bit here and there, but let, please continue, please continue. Okay. Uh, where did you lose me? <laughs> so we, we're just talking about what he did for yeah. final, his uh, final in uh, grade three. And um, he was talking, we, we sort of tried to put together a chart for his celebration of learning um, um, event in school to show what he had learned. And we tried to show, we tried to talk about what all the things that he had learned in different subjects that were connected to the friends disciplinary theme. So, for example, the you know it's where we are in place and time. And at that time, for his unit, he was studying about structures. So, in science and social science, he would be studying about things like uh, structures, famous structures around the world. What are man-made and what are natural structures? Um, what are the local structures available that are well known? And then he even studied about materials that are used to construct structures, like you know glass. Uh, wood, stone, and their properties, and why you would choose one over the other. And then for English, he actually um, he, he studied a little bit about myths and um, um, legends, but at the same time, uh, it's also the structure, it's a structure of the story, and he talked about location, you know, location of certain myths and legends, uh, ancient structures in those locations. And even, um, and he had to write a, a story about a local structure that he liked. So he chose the, the Batu Caves, the Batu Caves, the big Morgan statue, the Lord Morgan statue in Batu Caves, he chose that. And then um, for maths, you know, because it's all about structures, so he was learning about 2D and 3D shapes that, you know, a lot of structures are 3D shapes. And he also learned about the measurement of perimeter uh, area because structures relate to space. And he even learned how to read the coordinates in a simple way uh, in, on a map, on a Cartesian plane. And, and um, of course, in Mandarin and DM, they were also learning a lot of thematic words relating to structures. And in music, also certain things about you know, structure and form and art. They were learning about various artists, but they, a lot of the art they created also was uh, related to locations. And for his year, the year-end project, he actually had to design a, a house a house uh, that he he wanted to live in or something, and he he had to talk about all the different things, um, all the different subjects related to the house again. And this was uh, done on uh, he chose to do it on um, a planning um, software that the teacher suggested to them. And and this work, the one that you can see on the side there of this chart, is is work that he did on his own. I didn't help him at all. So it was really very amazing for me to see. You know, these are kind of things that maybe an architect or interior de designer would use, you know, it's very sparse, you can see he doesn't like a lot of furniture. <laughs> so, you know, he, he, he talked about having a library, you know, because he likes to read and then he has a, some sports cars and things like that. So, yeah, so this is like one kind of, another kind of assignment that, um, assessment for assessment that he did. So you go to the next one, Shirley, thank you. Okay, and then, um, of course, they have to do an orchestral uh, instrument in school. And I think it teaches them a lot of things as well. It teaches them to be dogged and resilient because learning an instrument um, like this is not easy. So this is actually uh, him playing um, the violin for his uh, recent school music assessment as well.
he's been doing. And, you know, he, he cried a lot during all the practice sessions, but he never gave up. And he kept trying until he managed to do it properly with the music accompaniment on the YouTube uh, recording. And, 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 you know, so he's learned to be goal-oriented, dogged, and very resilient, I think. Okay, so you go to the next um, slide. So the next, the next few slides are uh, about my daughter's work. And you know, as I mentioned, my daughter has Down syndrome. So I would like to tell you a little bit before you play the video about uh, what she, she only learned to read over the last year in online school. And she was a weak reader at the start of the school year. Where the, but, but you know, um, but the good thing is, I mean, recently one of my friends told me, you know, his daughter was in a kindergarten. And then the teacher would call all the kids up on the Zoom class one by one with their parents. And he would, the teacher would reprimand the child, children and the parents if they couldn't read or write properly. So imagine the kindergarten, you know, that really shocked me. But in, in my daughter's online class, even though she was a really weak reader at the start of the year, the teacher would still encourage her to read from the slides text on, shown on the screen. And then no kids in the class would laugh at her. No one of her. And everybody, even though she's slow at reading and sometimes she needs help with certain pronunciation or words, everybody would usually respectfully give her enough time to finish what she was reading. Interest, good. As a result, her reading improved tremendously as she felt motivated to continue trying. And she could not speak um, so coherently, but you know, this is a video we did recently for the Malaysian chapter of a global organization called Best Buddies that is trying to pair regular children um, so they can be friends with children in special needs. So I just play you a few minutes just to give you an idea of what she can do now in terms of articulation. Hey dear, my friend, we haven't met yet, but I'm very excited to get to know you. I'm sure we have a lot in common and we are above completely special in so many ways. Just that you I enjoy playing outside and feeling the wind on my face as I run around. Just that you Yeah, so you know it's really heartening to see because I think even for me at eight, I don't think I can do this kind of thing. And she's a child with a, a, a so-called um, special learning need. And the next one is actually, pardon the pyjamas. <laughs> she was actually practicing for a presentation on her unit inquiry, which required her to explore a product that she has come across in her daily life. Hello, my name is Isha, and this is my UOR presentation. All my product, a product has, um, is Magnum? Magnum ice cream. Okay. Ice cream is a good, it is also a one ice cream is Point a here? good product. Here. Yeah. Food product. Food product like, like you have a plague. Point food, right? Yeah, number four, nine. Okay, then set number three. Point to here, number three. Number three. Okay, now read number three. That page. I'll just talk about the image. So it's, she had to talk about a food product, you know, she had to talk about where it's sold and what's the Asians, you know, what's good about having Magnum ice cream here and what is it. So she had to do and it, it combines English, it combines um, yeah, so, and, and also some uh, social studies and also um, a little bit of research that she had to do. Um, this one is taken last year in December when her reading really started to improve. And this piece shows how they combine English, maths and art in one activity for art, um, grade two children. So she's reading um, a, a, a drawing she made about um, this activity. One day during spring time, Fisha went to the garden. She saw some birds in the trees. They were very noisy 
Isha. You can you can just the next slide. Maybe they are hungry. I um yeah, Shirley. Yeah, okay. The next slide you can see they actually combine um art. She had to draw and she had to write a story about it. And then in the story, there are some maths. There's some maths because she had to talk about two birds in each tree. So how many birds are there in the three trees? And then she had to do a video on that. So the next slide you can see, as I mentioned, she couldn't write at the beginning of last year. You see the first picture is things, how she would copy notes in class, you know, very incoherent. You can get some words, but it really doesn't make any sense. Then in January, she started, uh, I had to sort of guide her. We were in online school. I guide her about where to write the things. And then the teacher sort of like encouraged her and she could write very simple text. And the last picture is actually notes that she took just last month by herself. She only needed help with drawing the arrow. So she, she could copy notes by herself from the online screen. So the progress in one year is just totally amazing. And then the next slide, you can see that... Um, you know, she's actually, um, she, she couldn't play the violin on her own before, but now she's attempting to play uh, some notes on her own. This was for a music uh, competition entry. My name is Isha, and today I'm going to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on my violin. Hello. Usually I have the the notes on the fret but you know in the beginning now she's learning slowly slowly uh, not to not to get help from me so these are just things that my children have been doing and it's through the IB system that they have been um, growing you know in, in these areas so I think of course um, the best gains from an IB education can be obtained if your child is in an IB school. But IB principles can be applied at home anytime in daily life. And here are some points I always keep in mind when at home for my kids that you might like to try for your own. So focus on the strengths, but always try to look for ways that they can still improve on things that they may not like at first or they are not good at. You know, have a growth mindset. Two um, is also, um, yeah, next one, keep learning. Focusing on keep learning and versus keeping up, you know, if you remove the concept of testing, then you don't have this pressure of always keeping up, you know, and, and like, like, like uh, Dr. Vincent said, the external locus of control. So, you know, your child, you compare your child now to your child a year ago, instead of comparing with others and develop all the senses, not only focus on visual learning and written expression only, also uh, their listening skills, also, you know, touch and um, different things and use art to help yeah, younger children express their thoughts and ideas. Art as a tool for transdisciplinary learning versus just art as a subject. And I can show you some examples here. For example, the first picture you see with the trees here is my son's interpretation of um, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. He had to do it for music and art. And then in maths, they actually learn uh, the different angles in the letters of your name. And then also my daughter uh, drew a picture to show how, uh, you know, uh, sort of human activities can impact settlements badly and of course the last one he actually was working on some markers doing some pointillism in proper art class itself and encourage the child to always try new things taking risks building confidence and develop a lot of resilience like through learning an instrument a difficult instrument or even any instrument you know any instrument takes a lot of time to learn and practice and the next slide I just wanted to show you a couple more points um, so another thing that you can do is Always emphasize, learn by understanding, not learning by rote. Um, number two, um, you can also uh, find a team and try to apply, you know, the, like the ID style. Find a team and try to join the dots between different disciplines, learning about it in a different way. Number three, um, relate what kids learn to the real world, real world problems, encourage curiosity. So, you know, when here's a picture of them walking in the park. When we're in the park, they always ask me very interesting questions. They're very curious. Oh, why do these two birds make different sounds? Can they understand each other? And then my son will say, can birds fly to the clouds? Uh, is it because they can't, because it's space? Can we build a bird, a helmet with oxygen and a camera so it can fly to space and find out things? And I want to build that, uh, that helmet. And is it an invention or an innovation? Is it a discovery? You know, they will, ask, they will ask all sorts of things when they're outside because of the style of learning in school. Number four, 
and emphasize mastery of core skills over content because that is transferable and very useful when they go for higher education. And number five, the last point that I want to make is that as, as always, raising a global citizen. So I hope I've given you a little bit of flavor of how what an ID education looks like and, and how it could benefit your, your little ones and be able to offer some good differentiation uh, for diff very different children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lisheng, and thank you, Dr. Vincent. It is indeed a very meaningful webinar because the way I actually see it, not only that we can apply the IB concepts at school, we can also apply, apply the IB concepts at home to fully help our children to grow, to become a very, uh, an individual who can make a very profound contribution to the world. So we have a few questions here. So the first question is actually asked and actually addressed by Dr. Vincent. Okay, uh, Ms. Nicole KWS actually wants to ask about the assessment helped by IB in detail. Okay, for example, 50% project and 50% exam. So Dr. Vincent has the answer. Dr. Vincent, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, uh, so the common perception is using this idea of averages, um, but an average doesn't really say anything. So. In the IB, we score everybody not in like 70% or 80%, but we use a, a rubric and we give them a number from one to seven. And we say, okay, let's see what your scores look like. If your scores in their four assessments, and let's just give four numbers, if your scores look like this, four, five, five, six, then it, it clearly shows that you are growing and your endpoint score is six. So as a result, we say, okay, your end of year score is a six. If you took an average of that, you get a five. And that doesn't make any sense because you were growing past that point. You shouldn't be punished for the mistakes of the past. Keep moving forward. The other one uh, alternative is you get a four, five, six, and a five. So it really shows that you know you managed to hit a six once, but then you drop back down again. So at the end, your teacher would say, you're a five. And that's what we call a best fit technique. So we do that in the IB. We, we don't have like a 50% assessment and 50% um, uh, classwork, that kind of uh, mechanism. That's, that's far too simple, I suspect, uh, we're describing it. All right, Nicole, hope okay. that helps you. you know, so it seems to me that it is very much at a very encouraging way to encourage our students to improve themselves. And uh, we have another question here. How, uh, how do you in Fairview get to know about each child and have each teacher use their strength? Oh, this is, this is something that we do, we, we, we launched this year actually and quite special. So in Fairview, uh, we do a lot of this thing called uh, coaching classes and, and things. And this is something that we're piloting over in the KL as well. Um, each child goes through a coaching class. So this is the same kind of coaching that executives pay 2000 US dollars for. And in these coaching classes, what happens is they, they do peer accountability where they talk about their goals and then they share with each other and then they congratulate each other and support each other. But at the same time, the second part of that session, then they learn about things like, what's my strength? And then we use um, something called VIAME, V-I-A-M-E, um, and other strength profilers to say, this is your strength. This is you, what you're good at. This is who you are. We've got other personality tests built into that as well. And once we share that with the kids, they start to build a portfolio of who and what they are. And we record all of these things down as well. Then at our staff meetings, when we uh, talk with all of our teachers, we highlight a, a child and we spend a good 15 minutes just talking about children one at a time in that year group. And as a result, our teachers really know who the kids are, um, sometimes more than what their parents know about them because we've intentionally and strategically gone about this. Uh, in one way. We, you may know them in a different way, but we definitely know what their strengths are going to be and what their learning styles are very likely to be, what their interests and what their absolute fears are. Uh, so these are typically the things that all of our teachers are going to know about our kids. And um, it's, it's actually quite impressive the way that that's done. Yes, agree as well. Very impressive as well. So we have a question here as well. Uh, okay, is, okay, are Mandarin and music core, core subject at Fairview? Yes. Both are core subjects. Uh, Listen, do you want to share a little bit about the, the, your musical experience? Yeah. <laughs> and your Mandarin experience as well. I mean, your, your parents, you think it's better heard from you. Yeah, actually, my Mandarin experience, you know, is, is very uh, challenging also because I have a special child and a regular child and they don't speak any other language except English at home. So when we first started, it's ground zero. 
um, I'm a banana. So uh, we, they have the ground zero. And my daughter, you know, she, man, imagine writing uh, um, sort of uh, writing Chinese words for a child like her. Even the English word is a struggle. So we work with the teacher and, you know, the teacher allows uh, me to help her in that way. We, we, I used to use highlighter to even help her. And now she's starting to write on her own. And the Mandarin experience is thematic. It's not the kind of style of Mandarin we used to study, like those basic and it's thematic. So whatever you're studying for your, your unit of inquiry, then you learn the words related to that. So you kind of learn that across in the language as well. And then they use a lot of art also in the in Mandarin. Like recently, they use art in a, they were studying the historical origin of certain characters. And they, they draw the pictograph of the ancient characters. So Mandarin, you know, um, even BM also is very good because it's all transdisciplinary. Uh, the words are the theme of the, the thing. So they're learning about it in a very holistic way. The musical experience also in the beginning, um, my daughter, she would throw her violin on the floor all the time because she's frustrated. But slowly, slowly, the teacher encouraged her and then he taught me how to do certain things like chunking where we, we just do one bar, one bar, one bar. And now just now what you saw is now she can slowly play a few bars on her own. And my son also, even though he was fairly musical and uh, able to handle the violin, but he, he never challenged, you know, in the beginning, he doesn't challenge himself so much, but now he's motivated, you know, he wants to play according to the time of the accompaniment and every time, now they practice a lot more and they can see that practice leads them to a, like, you know, a better situation. So I think music teaches a lot of IB learner profile type of qualities also and approaches to learning, I think. Okay, thank you so much, Lishen. Okay, we have a question from uh, TFO Yap Reying. So I noticed IB helps to capture the kids' interest and follow their own pace, which is very good because every kid is unique. But how does IB help to build breed and resilience? Because uh, uh, that participant heard you say a lot about resilience. Yeah, it comes in the kind of thing because it's not, I wouldn't say it's easy. You have to do a lot of research. You have to be very self-directed in your learning. No, but the teacher will give you a guide, but the teacher won't tell you exactly what to do. So you have to be very resourceful. And when you're resourceful, you know, some there are many times, sometimes I leave my son and if he doesn't hand up his work, we just he, he has to suffer the consequences of it. Then the teacher has to see that, you know, he cannot do certain things and then he, the teacher and him have to work through it. So I think after over time, it, it, it's, it's something that become a quality that they, they, they are used to hard work. They're used to effort. They're used to it. So when you become used to it over time, it's atomic habits. Slowly, slowly you develop. It become a character trait. That's, that's how I see it. Yeah. Okay, if I can add in over there. Yeah. Um, grit and resilience. Resilience is different from perseverance. Perseverance is continue doing something even though you're getting punched in the face and it hurts and you just keep on persisting. So that's perseverance. The brother to that one called resilience where you fall down and then you get back up again. So that's, there are two different things there actually, but uh, perseverance and resilience, that's really only a, a one way I know that effectively does it. One, create a safe space so your child is not afraid to fall down. Two, help them fall down fast, repeatedly. Three, help them get back up and don't judge them when they fall. And if you keep on repeating this cycle again and again and again, you stay consistent as a parent, then your child will build resilience and perseverance. Yes, I, I do agree that the children in the system, they're not afraid of failure. Last time, my son used to be a perfectionist. He won't do it unless he can do it the way he wants to. And sometimes for a child, it's very difficult, you know, because you don't have the skills for it. But then over time, he, he learned to accept that he is growing and he has to continue and do certain things in his own, at his own pace and learn as he goes along. Yeah, safe environment indeed is very important. We have another question from Isaac R. Okay, uh, then we get to Li Sheng. So on a scale of 1 to 10, okay, 1 of course is low 10 is the highest. How much would you say the IB program involves parents' involvement? I would say... Um, a fair level of involvement is necessary, but uh, we also have a lot of parents in our classes who are full-time working parents, you know. So uh, the good thing about the IB system, I think, is because it's, um, 
because of the uh, relatively, um, even the parents who are working, you know, they still need to get involved at certain points. And, and you find that the community is kind of, um, I find that it's very, uh, it's, we have a bond. So we help each other along. And those parents, you know, where the child, usually the teacher steps in to actually guide those children whom they know, because they know each child well. Yeah, I would say, I, I would say that, yeah, relatively, um, you can get, and, and I think it's a system that encourages parent involvement if you look more involved, because there's some schools which they want a hands-off approach from parents. There's also the other um, extreme in the, you know, in the education industry, I think. I don't know whether, what, what Dr. Vincent wants to <laughs> say about this. <clears throat> uh, well, I got kids, and, and what I can tell you is the greatest gift you can give your kids is your presence. Um, and there's no such thing as too much presence. There's toxic presence, but there's no such thing as too much presence for your kids. Um, being there with them, um, even sitting quietly beside them as they work, different kinds of presence work. Um, the more you can get involved in your child's education, the better it is. Um, there's no such thing as too little. There, in the IB, I think that uh, you need to put in quite a bit at the beginning just to get them through the hurdle, to break out of those bad habits. But once they get going, you'll see that your involvement changes in, in style very dramatically from telling them what to do, which is very procedural, to support. I believe you. You can do this. You've done this before. You're going to be great. All right. Well done. You know, that's the kind of involvement you eventually shift to. And I think that's the most beautiful kind of involvement you can give them. So, okay, the way I see it, uh, the involvement will be getting lesser from direct involvement will be more like a supportive role that the parents play. That actually answer the questions actually asked by Nicole as well. Does parents need to guide the children throughout the project? We have received a lot of feedbacks about this because a lot of parents actually say that I'm very busy or I don't think that I'm ready to actually coach my uh, children because I'm not qualified, I'm not an educator. So what kind of involvement do we talk about? Yeah, Dr. Vincent and Ms. Dishen. Dr. Vincent first. <laughs> <laughs> so what we tell our parents is um, be involved with your child as they're doing their project, but don't do the project for them. If they need to fail that project, let them fail. It's, it's the right way because it has to be their work. If they need to score low on that, let them score low on that. But that has to be their work. If you end up doing the work for them, you'll always do their work for them. And at some point, they're going to go to university and you're not going to be able to do anything for them uh, and it's not going to work. Parents, a lot of the time, obsess about putting up appearances, about you know helping the kid do very, very well right now. So it's short-term gain at long-term expense. It causes a lot of damage. The support that you need to give your child, and I insist on a lot of this with my parents, be there, talk to them, show you're interested and your child will definitely fly from there. Yeah, I, the, the way I see it is like, I usually, before a large project, especially, which definitely you will need a little bit of guidance. So before he embarks on doing what he wants to do, we sit down and we discuss it. And he gives me his opinions about what he wants to do. And I'll tell him, you know, I'll give him an opinion whether it could be workable or maybe we explore other alternatives. But in the end, he has to put together the things himself. He has to gather material if he needs help acquiring the materials or doing certain things that he cannot manage, like cutting with a blade or something, then I come in and help him, usually like this. And I, I agree with you because as a parent to a special needs child, I also always believe we cannot rob them of the experience of learning. If you keep tying your child's shoelace, the child will never learn how to tie their shoelace and their brain will never learn how to coordinate their hands to do the task. And you, even though you have to wait longer, you have to let your child tie, wear their own shoes, you know, in that kind, using that kind of analogy, especially from, a, even from my angle, from a, a special needs parent. Yes, there is a learning curve for every child, but it is necessary. That's what we think. Okay, so we have time to actually have one last question before we proceed to the next. Uh, so any, anyone wants to actually ask any questions, you can actually ask right now. Okay, or you just type your questions in the chat box. Thank you. So in the meantime, the next slide, please. 
Okay, for those who are interested to know more about the top IB school in Malaysia, feel free to actually contact us via the contact number stated here and also email. And for those who are very interested as well, you can actually browse our website, okay, our Facebook. We have a lot of useful parenting tips okay, in the Facebook and you know, our website as well. So please, okay, for those who are interested, please browse our website. It's there a lot of information. Thank you. So uh, anyone wants to actually uh, ask any questions? Okay, so thank you so much. Oh, okay, can you explain? Okay, we have a question here. Can you explain a bit more about PYP, MYP, and IB diploma? Yeah, uh, sure. So there are three programs in the IB. The primary years program, which is primary school, the middle years program, which is secondary school, and then the IB diploma, which is called, which is the free university. Um, it's very obviously named. The primary years program um, focuses on building that beautiful foundation using ideas like inquiry and transdisciplinary things um, and differentiation and all these latest pedagogies. And then you take all of those pedagogies and you tear it up into the middle years program where it becomes age specific and it changes form, but the same concepts still apply over there. And then it goes, uh, they finish the MVP with the e-assessment. It's kind of an external exam, but they do it on the computer instead. And then after the MYP, the second school, they go to the diploma program, which is uh, a very, very well-recognized exam that incidentally, if everyone doesn't know, Fairview International School is the number one IB diploma school in Malaysia and number 47 in the world right now because of our scores. Um, and the diploma program is a two-year program where they take six subjects over there. Um, and you can get into any course in the world doing that. It's, it's fantastically recognized. So that's a like super nutshell on, on all the three programs. In therapy, we do five years of primary and five years of secondary, and then two years of pre-university after that. Um, the, the programs are essentially the right way to teach. I, I don't know how else to describe you. Traditional education tells you about what you, your child can learn, but they never really focus on how your child learns. So they say these are the facts that you're supposed to learn and then they leave the teachers to do whatever they want with regards to how they learn. They don't manage that section. So every CIE school has a different way of teaching because they don't really manage how they teach. They only manage what they teach. And it's the same for all education, tradition, all traditional education systems that don't pay attention to the how. The IB says what you learn is not that, that important. We're okay with using syllabus, but the how you learn is super important to us. And then they really keep a really tight hold on the how. So they come every five years to do a check on me to just tell Jesse, are you teaching properly? Uh, show me how you do the inquiry. I want to see your classes, so on and so forth. And then they check up on us. So that's really the super nutshell of the ID. It's not American. It's not British. It's not Australian. It's international. It doesn't belong to any one country in the world at all, uh, contrary to popular belief. Okay. Now, I, I hope that's, that's helpful, Nicole, because that's, the fastest summary I can ever give you. Uh, and it's also a very fantastic summary as well. Okay, uh, Ms. Nishen, you have to actually add something? Uh, no, <laughs> but I have a question that a lot of my friends always ask me. If, they, if, it, if the children are coming from another system like the government school or even the, the uh, other, um, you know, like the ICGSC system, you know, and they want to move to an IB school maybe in uh, middle years or for the DP, uh, is it difficult, you know, uh, can they cope? That, that's a painful question to answer, and I'll be very yeah. honest about that one. The longer your child is in a traditional system, the longer they have had to build bad habits. Bad habits, like there's only one right answer. Bad habits, like uh, teacher, teacher, this is a revision class, right? Are these questions coming out in the exam? This kind of really, really bad habit. Um, so the longer they're in that system, the later you wait, the more damage is being uh, uh, is happening, and the more difficult the transition. PY primary school kids they transition just like that, very fast. Within one month, two months, a little bit of cry in the beginning, but they'll be over it very fast. Middle school more closer to about six months of transition because they've had a lot of bad habits built into them, uh, and, and diploma is also about six months uh, to get them over that hurdle. But once they break the hurdle, oh my gosh, they're just such different people when they're done. 
uh, but breaking the hurdle can be a really painful process. So on behalf of all parents, uh, all educators worldwide, please don't put your children through that process. Don't, don't force me to break your children's bad habits. Uh, do it early, please. Because it's really painful when you watch them to unlearn those bad habits. It's really, really painful. Yes, indeed. So parents, okay, please, okay, I know your child into an IB school as soon as possible to benefit your children as soon as possible. That's what uh, we want to actually say. So, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Vincent and Ms. Vincent to, for today's wonderful sharing. We appreciate it. So, and thank you so much, uh, all the participants for attending today's webinar. I wish you a very happy Saturday. And for those who like to actually browse our website, okay, we have a QR code here. Feel free to scan and then to know more about the promotions available okay, at Fairview International School. Once more, thank you so much. Okay, and have a nice day.